what we've discovered and what we've been working on really for the last four years is that there's an arterial component to this pathology that lends itself amenable to endovascular minimally invasive treatment options. And that's really what I want to go into today is the story of how we got here, where we are, and where we plan to go in the future with this. Um, just disclosures. Um, I'm the national co-PI for the embolized trial, which I will be discussing a little bit today. So chronic subdural hematoma, uh, as we know, um, significant mortality rates, even higher uh, morbidity rates, um, typically affects an elderly, fragile patient population. Our uh, standard treatment for this has always been surgical drainage, burr holes, craniotomy, but recurrence rates in this patient population are quite high, about 15 to 20% on average, and as high as a third of all patients get a symptomatic recurrence that needs retreatment. And again, this is a, a medically fragile patient population. These are typically elderly people, who have other comorbid factors, who do very poorly with anesthesia, who do poor with hospital admissions, hospital delirium. Um, and this is predicted to be the most common neurosurgical uh, condition by 2030 due to the aging patient population. So something that as neurosurgeons we see a lot of and something that's always been a little bit problematic from the standpoint of uh, recurrence and retreatment. The ideology, as we alluded to before, is due to the traumatic or spontaneous tearing of bridging veins between the dura and the brain. Um, but then what happens afterwards is a pretty interesting process. There's an inflammatory cycle where inflammatory cells and fibroblasts will migrate to the dura and form membranes around these subdural hematomas. And you'll see oftentimes when you're operating on these and on imaging, multiple layers of subdural membranes around the hematoma, which have mixed age acuity blood products. Now, patient may fall once, get a subdural hematoma, they come see you a month later, um, it's got some chronic blood, it's got some subacute blood, but there's also acute blood in it. And even though the patient may have had only one ictus to cause the hemorrhage, there's oftentimes lots of mixed age acuity blood. And our theory for this is that these multiple membranous layers that form these, this inflammatory cycle, there's a neovascularization that occurs. And what happens is that these neovascularization blood vessels are very friable and they will spontaneously rebleed even without subsequent trauma. And it's this vicious cycle of rebleeding that causes this mixed acuity blood products, prevents these subdural hematomas from melting away on their own, causes recurrence, causes growth over time. And we believe that this was due to an arterial supply, an arterial process, which is at the, uh, the engine for, for, for forming this. In fact, when we send pathologic analysis of our subdural membranes, we're actually able to see neovasculature of arteries within them. And really the MMA, the middle meningeal artery, is the only artery in the neighborhood of, of this dura of this uh, subdural membrane, which runs in the dura. And it's been demonstrated histologically as well. This is actually a subdural membrane from one of my patients that I sent to pathology. And you can see, again, these endothelial cells that are very reminiscent of small arterials. So we think that there's an arterial phenomenon um, due to neovascularization and inflammation that essentially keeps these subdurals alive or at minimum uh, prevents them from going away and, and at worst causes them to recur. So our hypothesis about four years ago is that by devascularizing these arterial inputs of the subdural membrane with MMA embolization, we would ultimately prevent that spontaneous rebleeding episodes that occur, and this would allow for subsequent resolution of the subdural hematoma. And we really can use this across the spectrum for hematoma patients. We can use it as a treatment modality for surgical recurrences that occur after surgery, as well as prophylaxis after surgery to prevent recurrence. Even more powerfully, we can use it as an initial treatment modality in lieu of surgical evacuation for patients that have failed conservative therapy. The procedure itself is, is quite straightforward from the standpoint of endovascular. So we're using our most minimally invasive sized guide wires, guide catheters, and microcatheters. And essentially what we do is we go into the MMA, which is a branch off the external carotid artery. We ensure that there are no collateral vessels to the ophthalmic artery or to the petrosal branch, which can supply cranial nerve number seven. And once we ensure that safety, we started out by injecting um, heavily diluted PVA particles. So polyvinyl alcohol particles are um, very safe, inexpensive particles used for embolization throughout the body. And we've used them for decades to embolize meningiomas from the MMA. So applying them for the subdural hematoma was really just a new application of, of, a of a technique that we had already been doing for some time and we demonstrated safety in. And we would get baseline CTs followed by repeat imaging in two and six weeks. Here's an example of the anatomy of the MMA on angiography, a lateral view. You see after the MMA sort of makes that hairpin turn where the small petrosal branches come off, it bifurcates into basically the temporal parietal branch and the frontal branch. And on the left is a pre-embolization picture, on the right is what it looks like after embolization. We don't sacrifice the entire artery, we, we basically just inject the particles distally so they take out the small arterials that connect up with the membranes. 
It's very important to look for important uh, anastomosis. So here's an example of a patient who had a uh, very prominent petrosal branch. Um, and again, this artery is really important to, to be aware of because if you embolize that, the patient will have a, a, a seventh uh, a facial, a seventh or palsy on that side. Here you see on the left an ophthal a prominent ophthalmic artery collateral. Um, some people have ophthalmic arteries that feed their eyes. Some people have the MMA with an ophthalmic collateral that feeds their eyes. Some people have both. But again, very important to be aware of these collaterals when you're doing an embolization. Um, when you see that, you can go into each branch selectively here on the right. On the left is what it looks like after embolizing the frontal branch. Then we pull our catheter back, go into the temporal branch. And on the right, you see what both branches look like after embolization with preservation of the ophthalmic artery. It's very interesting if you look at the angiography of patients with subdural hematomas. So they have something that patients who don't have subdurals don't have. And this is what's called this um, cotton wool staining essentially of the um, arteries. You basically see these fingers, these small arterioles that have formed um, from the MMA. And this was one of our first radiographic clues that arteries played a role in the pathogenesis of this pathology. The fact that these MMAs were forming these small fingers um, going up to the subdural hematoma. Um, this is an example of what the um, images look like on the left AP and on the left lateral, excuse me, on the right lateral, after we've injected PVA particles, which sit in contrast. And what you see is the contrast pooling within the subdural hematoma shape itself. So again, more radiographic evidence that there's an arterial connection between these arteries and the subdural hematoma, which we've always felt was a venous pathology. This picture I like very much. On the right, we see a coronal view of an acute on chronic subdural hematoma. And on the left, you see an unsubtracted in the middle of subtracted view, but basically the contrast taking the exact same shape of the subdural membrane itself. So again, radiographic evidence of an arterial input to the entire shape of the subdural hematoma. On the left is a pre and on the right is a post-op head CT of a patient before and after embolization. When we first did these procedures, we were getting calls from the radiologist saying the patient was having interval acute hemorrhage because uh, the blood was you know, slightly more radio dense on the right than on the left, but it's not interval hemorrhage, it's contrast, which is pooling within the subdural hematoma in that space. So again, you know, all of this at the beginning when we were uh, you know, broaching this hypothesis, we wanted to have a little bit of a proof of concept before we had clinical data and all of these radiographic findings were some part of our proof of concept. And we had originally published on that a few years back. These were the first five patients that we treated and the first five patients treated worldwide um, for symptomatic subdural hematomas that would have met the criteria for surgery, but we treated them with embolization instead um, as an upfront alternative. And on the top, you see their preoperative head CTs and on the bottom, their postoperative head CTs. And we basically performed volumetric analysis on these subdural hematomas before and after embolization. And what we found is that by two weeks, these subdural hematomas tend to stabilize and shrink slightly. But by six weeks, they really uh, dissipate and resorb. That's when we're seeing the 60, 80, 90% resorption of those subdural hematomas. And it makes sense because really what happens when you embolize the arteries, you're interrupting that vicious cycle of rebleeding, And then it takes time for the body to obviously resorb the blood like it does any other part of your body that has a bruise or a bleed. Um, and that typically occurs by that four to six week mark. So it's important to counsel these patients that during that time period, if they decompensate, you know, they still may ultimately need surgery. And this procedure doesn't preclude them from getting that. But given the fact that most subdural hematoma patients present progressively but insidiously, we oftentimes have that window of time, such as six weeks, to um, you know, do this procedure and have them turn the corner. This is a patient that presented um, with a three-time recurrent subdural hematoma, every time evacuated, every time recurrent. And finally, after the third operation, we did an embolization and it didn't come back. So we study basically three groups of patients in our initial series, patients upfront treatment who had failed conservative therapy um, in lieu of surgery, those who had received surgery and had symptomatic recurrence, and those who had received surgery and were getting the embolization procedure pro prophylactically perioperatively to assess recurrence rates. And what we found is that as a primary treatment to avoid surgery, for those who were symptomatic, so the recurrences as well as the upfront patient population who would have met criteria for surgery, we were able to avoid surgery in 92% of these patients. So we had an 8% failure rate in that population, but 92% of patients who traditionally would have been taken to the operating room, we were, avoid, we were able to avoid that from happening. And this data has now borne out over the greater than 300 patients that we've done this procedure on, which represents the largest volume in the world for this procedure. In addition, we found that when we applied this procedure to patients who needed surgery, 
because their hematomas were too large when they came in. Um, we basically dropped the recurrence rate down from that 15 to 20 percent traditional recurrence rate down to 4.5 percent. So, hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from NeurosurgeryTraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.